let me start by saying that we can measure social mobility in a very simple way. <clears throat> it's just a question of what's the correlation in any measure of social status between you and your children. And if that correlation is zero, then the world is born anew in each generation. If the correlation is one, then everything gets replicated in the next generation. And the rate of social mobility should also connect to the amount of inequality in any society, because if there's a constant set of shocks coming in terms of wealth or income or status, then the greater is the persistence, the greater is that intergenerational correlation, then the greater will be the variance of outcomes, the stable variance within a society. And so one way that you can get much less inequality in a society is to have much more social mobility. Now, the conventional measures of social mobility uh, look at uh, just what is the correlation on any measure between parent and child. And this uh, diagram here, which is due to Miles Korak, who I believe uh, addressed the same group, uh, shows the range of social mobility rates for earnings across the world in recent years. And there's actually a, a very powerful message from this simple diagram. One of the things that actually comes out from these conventional measures is mobility <coughs> rates are actually very high on conventional measures. Despite all of the social concern about rigidity in society, these types of mobility rates that you observe are you know, a correlation of between 0.2 and 0.5. They actually imply that in somewhere like Scandinavia, only 4% of the variation in earnings outcomes is actually explained by inheritance from parents. And even in the United States, it's only going to be 22%. And so one of the things that's actually puzzling is, given why is there so much concern about social mobility, given that conventional measures of this actually suggest uh, a great deal of fluidity. And then the second thing that the conventional estimates suggest is that there is a social mobility problem. If social mobility, if the intergenerational correlation is only 0.2 in earnings in Sweden, but it's 0.6 in Brazil, then it says that one or other of these societies has got to have an inefficient allocation of tasks to people, right? Because if social mobility can be that low in Sweden, it implies that in somewhere like Brazil, there must be a lot of people who, because of accidents of birth, are now ending up in a task or employment or a status that it's not appropriate to their abilities. And so this wide variation across different societies seems to say that social mobility really is going to be an issue. And either social mobility is too high in Sweden or it's too low in Brazil. And then the third thing that the conventional evidence suggests is that what matters to social outcomes has to be a combination of culture, education, and social networks. It can't be just the genetic inheritance of abilities. Because if it was really just the genetic inheritance, then we'd observe very similar social mobility rates across all different societies. And so what this seems to suggest is that social mobility really is something that's under social control. We should spend a lot of money, a lot of attention, a lot of energy in trying to devise the appropriate uh, mechanisms. So that's the conventional picture. The limitations of this picture is that these measures tend to look at just one generation. And also, they tend to look just at one aspect of people's status. And what I've ended up doing is pioneering another method of measuring social mobility, which uses people's surnames. And what is interesting about all of us if we come from the typical European society, <coughs> is that we carry this surname that links us to a very distant past. So my surname, Clark, emerged in the English <laughs> Middle Ages, and I'm probably at the end of a lineage of 30 different men called Clark, uh, and then end up with this name. <laughs> 
right? And this is true in uh, other societies. Surnames came later in many other societies. In the Netherlands, not till the period of the French Revolution. In Sweden, in the lower classes, not till the 19th century. But in many, many societies, we have the existence of this pattern of naming where you inherit a surname. And what's interesting in England is that some of these surnames people inherit, they even completely forgot what the surname meant. So there's a, a name in England, Alabaster, which is a corruption of the name, the medieval name for crossbowman uh, in Latin, which no one in modern England actually knows <laughs> about uh, its origin, but the name still survived across all of these generations. And in England, for example, the original surnames arrived in 1066 with the invasion of the Norman conquerors. And it's the case that those Norman surnames are still a significant set of the population in England even today. And one astonishing thing about those Norman surnames is that they remained overrepresented in English armies sorry. up until... I'm being told that they cannot hear, so... Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, they remained overrepresented in English armies up until uh, the 19th century. Uh, and that uh, there was something about Normans <laughs> and violence that actually continued across more than 600 years. Now, what should happen if social mobility rates really are as represented by these modern studies should be that over a matter of only three or four generations, all surnames, even if they start out with high or low status, should become average. And surnames should just lose status information very rapidly because uh, with these kind of rates of social mobility, everyone will be regressing to the mean rather rapidly. And after a very few generations, you won't be able to tell anything about what someone's origins were. And so we can actually use how rapidly surnames are actually moving towards average status as another way of measuring social mobility in societies. And when I started doing this, what I thought was that this would just be an interesting way to actually measure social mobility across many centuries in pre-industrial societies. And that that would be the main interest in this, would be just another way of kind of measuring social mobility. But it turns out that when we do this, a surprising and kind of universal fact emerges. And that is, whatever society you look at, surnames persist in status much more strongly than would be expected by any conventional measure. The intergenerational correlation of status implied by surnames is typically in the order of 0.7 to 0.8, whereas the conventional measures are down at 0.2 to 0.5. And so what is actually happening when you observe surnames is that status actually persists within surnames for as long as 10 to 15 generations. So a matter of 300 to 450 years. So that's the first surprising thing is the extraordinary persistence of surname status. The second surprising thing is that that rate of persistence does not vary across history. It's the same in medieval England as it is in England in 2016, right? There has been no improvement in social mobility rates between the feudal period in England and the modern England of today. But also we can measure this rate in Hungary, for example, which went through a period of communism and then return to a period of capitalism. What's the implied social mobility rates under communism? It, it's the same as in medieval England. Uh, we can look at Sweden, which on conventional measures has very, very rapid social mobility. If we look at surname persistence, we can measure this in Sweden from 1750 till now. It's the same as medieval England. <laughs> And it's the same in Sweden in 2000 as it was in Sweden in 1750. And so as I say, there's just two very startling facts that emerge from these surnames, which are the extraordinary persistence of status in the surnames, and also 
the kind of universality of this measure. I have not found any society which has markedly more rapid social mobility rates measured by surnames than those that you see as, as say, in the medieval period. Now, here's an example just to show you how, what, how this looks in practice. England has many rare surnames. By the time you get to the modern period in England, because surnames were formed before 1300, common surnames like my own, Clark, have average status, right? They have actually regressed to the mean. But there are lots of rare surnames in England. Some of them have high status at any time, and some of them have low status. And so what we can do in England is we can go to the period 1800 to 1829, and we can take all the rare surnames, and then we can figure out who with a rare surname is attending Oxford or Cambridge, and who is not. And so the first list shows the Oxbridge surnames, the second, the non-Oxbridge surnames, and you can see that they look very similar, right? You wouldn't be able to look at those lists and say, oh, I can tell what are high-class surnames and what are not. And so these Oxbridge surnames are ones of unusually high status because only 1% of the population of England would attend Oxford or Cambridge. And so when a surname only has 20 holders and someone is at the university, that's typically a sign that is relatively high status. Now, what happens to the status of these surnames over time? So the yellow uh, diagram, that shows the names that were just chosen because they happened to be at Oxford around about 1800. And it shows how much overrepresented they are at the university compared to their share of the population. And so in that generation, when they're observed, they're 64 times more likely to be the university than the average person in England. But what you can see is that those names still now in 2010 are still four times more likely to show up at Oxford or Cambridge than the average name. And you can calculate from that rate of decline of their overrepresentation what the implied rate of persistence is, and it's 0.77. But even better, you can go back in time to 1530 and again calculate what's the rate of rise of those names towards elite status. And it's amazingly, it's symmetrical. It's 0.77 again. But already by 1530, these names were already overrepresented. And so what it's saying is, this is a period of roughly 500 years. If you are observed to have high status in a certain surname lineage around about 1800, you can actually say that people with that name for something like a period of 500 years will have high status in England. And we can do the same actually with low status names. You'll see the reverse pattern <laughs> where you're going to be below average for 500 years if you happen to be observed having low status like this. And then the red dots, the other curve, that was a set of people whose names were identified as having high status just because they were wealthy in the early 19th century. And as you see, you see a very similar pattern then to these names, that they're overrepresented at the university, that they rise very slowly to this overrepresentation, and then they decline again very slowly. And so we can do this in any generation in England, and you'll see exactly the same pattern. And as I say, the interesting features here are, this is England, which experienced the Industrial Revolution. In the early 19th century, there is no government support for education. There is zero support. It's a laissez-faire economy. In the late 19th century, public education support was brought in, the requirements of schooling. By the time you get to 1920, people have to stay in school to age 15. By the time I'm included in this uh, database, because I went to Cambridge, uh, by the time you get to when I went to Cambridge, the, the government paid for all of my education. And so you see this enormous rise in public support. What does it do to the rate of social mobility? Zero. It has absolutely no effect on how quickly new people are arriving at the university or old families are leaving the university. And so what you see here is you cannot, in these social mobility measures, trace out any event happening in British history. As far as these measures are concerned, nothing has happened in England from 1300 to now. Nothing is visible. And as I say, it turns out this is just a typical uh, case. And so in the interest of time, uh, let me move to the next question, which is, this measure 
looks only at the patriline uh, because that's how surnames are inherited through the male line. And so one question you might raise is, well, could it be the case that mobility in the patriline will be unusually rigid? And this might be the case if women, for example, just marry randomly, whereas men in the patriline, somehow they transmit status, uh, but women, the transmission is very different. But it turns out that we can observe in England, even pre-1880, that men and women marry in very similar ways. The, if you look at sons-in-laws and family and compare their wealth to those of sons, you find that they're absolutely equivalent, right? And so daughters of rich families marry men who are also rich. If you look at the daughters-in-law compared to the daughters, again, their wealth is very similar at death. And there's lots of evidence that it's pretty much symmetrical. So even though we're only looking at the patriline, what you're actually seeing here is just a representation of what mobility would look like for any line that you followed uh, in these families. And actually, once you see this persistence of status and surnames, it turns out that it's reflecting something much deeper about social reality. And we can illustrate this with the great scientist Darwin. Uh, and because Darwin is so famous, we know all of his great-great-grandchildren. And he has just 27 great-great-grandchildren, even though he had 10 children. Uh, 11 of Darwin's great-great-grandchildren are notable enough to have Wikipedia pages or Times obits uh, devoted to them. They do everything. They're authors, they're university professors, they're doctors, they're painters. I come from a pretty good economics department. I think it's ranked about 25 or 30 in the United States. Darwin's great-great-grandchildren are more distinguished than myself and my colleagues. <laughs> uh, just from this accident of being descended from this guy in the 19th century. And what it's actually saying is that there is a surprising persistence that is going on in societies of social status that somehow is not being ca captured by the regular measures of social mobility. And then this just illustrates the various countries now that we've been able to do these studies for. Uh, and the ones in black are ones that people came to me and said, well, how about doing social mobility in Barcelona? I said, OK, if you've got the data, we can do it, right? And so you can see that, as I say, it's across a whole range of countries that you can observe essentially the same phenomena. Um, and then here's another picture which shows for a variety of modern countries, what are the surname estimates of social mobility? And what are the conventional estimates? And you can see that the surname estimates are just, they, they vary a fair amount, but they're pretty flat across societies. They don't tend to coincide in any way with the conventional estimates. And then, before we go on and talk about why this happens, let me just give Sweden as another kind of nice example of the rigidities that surnames uncover. And Sweden is a nice example because it is a society with what are regarded as very high rates of social mobility by conventional measures. And so it turns out that in Sweden, there's a whole set of surnames that are identified with counts and barons. There is a Swedish aristocracy. Uh, that aristocracy actually has its own house in Stockholm, which keeps comprehensive measures of the genealogy of all the noble families of Sweden. Uh, those noble families were mostly uh, formed, sorry, were mostly formed by 1800. And so once those names were established, now we can observe well, what happened to their social status from 1800 to the present. And the aristocratic surnames can be quite elaborate. Uh, because sometimes they, when people were ennobled, they would make up these new names that had these heraldic uh, noble elements, such as Lejon Hufud, uh, Gillen Stierna. Uh, and uh, Lejon Hufud, of, of course, is a well known economist, but he actually comes from this uh, noble family in Sweden. And then a second thing that Swedes did is that if they went to university in the 18th century, they would adopt a new name, many of them. And these were Latinized names. They're learning in Latin, and this was a, dis a sign of, your, when you got your degree, you also got a new name. 
And so a lot of famous Swedish scientists from this period actually have these names, such as Celsius. Uh, and they're very identifiable then in the record in Sweden because of this particular characteristic. And so we have these two classes of <coughs> elites in Swedish society. And then we could ask, looking at doctors, how much, what's your overrepresentation of these names among doctors graduating all the way from 1900 to 2000? And what you find is that they're still heavily overrepresented, even up to the current period, and that the implied rate of mobility from the decline in their overrepresentation of these classes of names is in the order of 0.72, right? And so again, it's very close to this kind of picture for England. And if you take the Swedish Royal Academy, which awards, of course, a variety of Nobel Prizes, if you take the elite groups, you can trace that back all the way till the 18th century. And what you find is the persistence of elite names in the Swedish Royal Academy is actually 0.87. Uh, they have extraordinary levels of persistence. And then if you take the low-class names in Sweden are those that end in S-O-N. If you look at anyone in the Swedish Academy who has name ending S-O-N, what you find is that they're heavily underrepresented even to the present time. Your chance of now being in the Swedish Royal Academy is about eight times as great if you have a high status name as opposed to having a name that ends in S-O-N. And so again, even in Sweden, where these conventional measures are showing a lot of mobility, you've got this persistence. Now, oh, and then one recent study we just did was, that I mentioned was Hungary from 1946 to 2017. Again, it doesn't seem to matter whether you have communism or capitalism, status persists, okay? Now, that leads to this very interesting question of what is happening here? Why are these surname results so different from those that are observed with individual studies? And what is actually happening here is that social mobility actually has two different components. If we take a high status person, by any measure in the first period, we'll observe in the next period relatively rapid regression towards the mean. But then what happens is that that regression immediately slows down dramatically. And you see persistence then from then on. And what the surnames are actually doing is they're capturing that long-run persistence that's in the social mobility statistics. And what's happening is that why is that social mobility so great in the first period? Well, part of this is just because if you take one aspect of someone's status, like their education or their income, that's not going to be a full measure of their status, right? If I sign up to become a literature professor, I'm going to have relatively low income, but I'm going to have fairly high social status, right? And if we just take these single measures, we're likely then not to capture a kind of a full inventory of someone's status. But there's also a second feature, which is just, there's a lot of accidents in people's lives. Uh, there are people who happen to get that job or people who happen to choose the wrong field, people whose experiment went brilliantly compared to people whose experiment was a complete failure. And so there's lots of accidental elements to people's lives that get reflected in their social status. But what's interesting is that those kind of accidents don't seem to be hereditable. There's a deeper underlying status that people have that we don't even really know what it is, <laughs> which is the transmittable part to the next generation. And that is actually what the surname estimates are capturing, which is that there's very strong transmission of this underlying uh, component. And so what is actually happening, the way you can portray this is we behave as though we had an underlying status genotype, which is transmitted across generations. And then within any generation, there are random elements that link that genotype to the observed phenotype. And what will happen is the more these random elements appear in a society, the more social mobility there will seem to be. So why does Sweden on conventional measures look like it's a highly mobile society? 
It's because in a society like Sweden, when you measure earnings, those actually are very compressed. A bus driver and an architect in Sweden earn essentially very similar amounts. And so earnings actually give a very weak signal about what someone's underlying social status is. And so in a society like that, it'll seem like there's a tremendous amount of flux, even though it's going to be the case that occupational inheritance will be much stronger in someone like Sweden than these earnings inheritance would be. But if you go to Brazil, earnings become a much better indicator of what someone's true underlying social status is. And so in a society like that, it'll seem like there's much more rigidity. And so partly this is just saying that there are these social accidents that can actually create an impression that there really are differences in mobility across societies. And sometimes there are, right? If, if earnings are more accidental, then you will actually get you know, more variation across generations. But it isn't the case that the true underlying inheritance of overall social status is actually any better in faster in Sweden, or sorry, more mobile in Sweden than it is somewhere else. Now, what the surname estimates then are actually going to capture is, they'll capture this long-run mobility, but they will also capture what the social mobility is of any identified social group. And so one of the puzzles that people have encountered in societies like America is when you look at ordinary social mobility rates, it seems there's a lot of social mobility. But if you look, classify people by social group, if you take the Jewish population, the Latino population, the black population, <coughs> what you'll observe is tremendous rigidity. And that is often then attributed to issues of race and prejudice and discrimination. But the argument here is that no, you would find this with any group of people that you observed. Any group that you could find, no matter how indistinguishable they are from the rest of the population, if they have high earnings on average, they will continue to have those high earnings for many, many generations into the future. It's not actually a sign that there's necessarily any kind of discrimination or rigidities within the society. It's just actually capturing it when you look at the group level, that there is this long-run, persistent, low rate of social mobility. And at the group level, the short-run movements are all averaging out. And all you're seeing then are these long-run kind of regression towards the mean. And so what this is saying is that if you want to predict also what will be the future of different groups within any society, it's these surname estimates that will tell you where you're going to go. And so if you find that in Belgium, for example, the Walloons have lower income than the Flemish. This says eventually the two groups will converge maybe in 300 years, right? But that's how long these processes are going to take, right? If you find now in modern America that Hindus have the highest income of any incoming group, what this will say is you can expect that to be true again for 300 years, that the major upper class in the United States is actually going to be the Hindu population. And so it's actually, for certain purposes, the surname estimates actually are really the ones that we should be concerned about. Now, a more fundamental question that comes up is, what is transmitting this social genotype, right? Why is it that there's this incredible persistence that's going on even at the family level? We can, because now with data in England, we have a new project where we actually have constructed the individual histories of about 260,000 people back to 1750. So where we know who they are across seven generations. And if you run these models on the individual histories, you'll see exactly this phenomena. In the first generation, rapid mobility, and then you immediately move to this low rate, and it's the same rate for every generation after that, but at a very low rate, okay? So the question that comes up is, well, what is it that's transmitting this? And here we have competing explanations. And so my colleagues in economics and sociology, they love the idea of human capital, family investment, uh, family cultures, social networks. What I have to tell you here, though, is that the evidence 
quite strongly is that this is actually mainly driven by genetics. And that there really is a strong genetic underpinning to people's actual achieved social status. Now, in the short time that we've got here, I'm only going to be able to say a few things about that, but I'm giving a seminar tomorrow where we'll actually show you that we can test this model uh, formally. And with this English data, for example, we can test what the correlation is of fifth cousins, fourth cousins, third cousins, and see, does it follow a pattern that would be predicted by genetic transmission? Because there will be a very distinctive pattern that you would observe in such a case. But why is it the case that, uh, surprisingly, the evidence seems to be that most social status transmission is genetic? So as I say, there is this question of the patterns of inheritance. And so one very interesting thing that emerges in studies of social mobility is the correlation between a parent and a child is the same as the correlation between siblings on any aspect of status. So if you look at longevity, if you look at education, if you look at wealth, if you look at income, the correlation between siblings is about the same as that between parent and child. That is actually predicted by additive genetic models of inheritance. That is exactly what that model predicts. It would not be predicted by most mechanisms of social transmission. Because what was going to happen if it's the environment that matters? What happens is the children are exposed to the same environment, but that environment systematically has to be different from the parental environment. There still has to be regression to the mean. And so it's got to be the case if you have high status parents that your environment has to be weaker than the parents in terms of outcomes or else there wouldn't be regression to the mean. And so there'll actually systematically be, be a tendency for parents to have different environments for children, but children to have to share the same environment. And so we would expect children to be much more correlated than between parents and children. And just to, to give an example from my own personal history, um, I was one of four children. We grew up in identical environments, right? I mean, our parents had exactly the same expectations from all of us. Uh, we should have exactly the same outcome <laughs> if environment is really uh, uh, strongly governing things. But both of my parents came from families of 12. Uh, on one side, my grandfather was alcoholic. On the other side, my grandfather had a violent uh, disinclination to educate any of his children. <laughs> uh, and so that you could see that their environments were very different from the ones that we yeah, you know, shared. And so this is not going to be untypical in terms of transmission of kind of social status. And so as I say, one of the surprising things is the patterns of inheritance are actually consistent with genetic transmission, but not particularly consistent with very strong environmental influences. The second thing is uh, adoption studies. There's a very nice one, which I recommend to you if you've not read, by Bruce Sacerdote in the Quarterly Journal of Economics which looked at Korean children adopted after the Korean War into American families, <clears throat> where the, the crucial thing in this adoption was that no one knew anything about these children. They were orphans in Korea that no one knew anything about the background of them. And so then they were just randomly assigned to American families. The American families varied by a factor of 20 to 1 in terms of their income. That had zero effect on the incomes of the adopted children. Whether you were placed in the family that had 20 times the income or one time the income, it made no difference. There was a very slight effect on educational outcomes. There was a tendency for the adoptive children, these two unrelated adopted children, to correlate in the household, which implied there were some household effects. But systematically, the implied genetic effects were three times greater than the environmental effects. And so the finding of this is very clearly that genetics has surprising importance in terms of outcomes. Uh, another issue that comes up is that groups that marry endogamously, if genetics is very important in transmitting underlying social status, then any group that doesn't marry out will maintain its social status forever. And if we look at the path of history, 
we can find such groups. And one that's very interesting is the Coptic population in Egypt. After the Muslim invasions, it was up to the local inhabitants whether they wanted to become Muslim or not. But if you didn't become Muslim, you had to pay a head tax. And so what systematically happened in Muslim societies was the lower class converted and the upper class tended to remain with the original religion. And so in Muslim societies all across the Middle East, Christians, the remnant Christian population, tended to be an elite. And in a society like Egypt, the Copts then, starting about 700 AD, were this 10% of the population, but there was no intermarriage with the Muslim population over the next 1,300 years. The Copts are still an elite in Egypt, uh, and that is not possible without almost zero rates of social mobility uh, unless there is just absolute persistence in relative status between the two groups. And so this is kind of an interesting example where it's very consistent with an idea that it would be what you would expect if it's really there's an important kind of genetic underpinning. And it's saying also that the cops, it was nothing about their religion. They just happened to be the upper class group within that society. They had certain characteristics. They formed this separate group. They remained intermarrying within that group and they continued in their status. And then the next question is, well, how elites get formed? Uh, again, if really genetics is important, then the argument would be the way elites are typically going to be formed is not by going through a religious conversion, not by going through some cultural change when they embrace education or don't embrace education. It'll just be because some focusing mechanism leads to a upper group within the population becoming distinct or becoming a distinct subgroup. And it turns out if you look at uh, Jewish history, uh, Jews in almost any society they're in represent a social elite. The Jewish population by 1400 in Europe was about 10% of the original Jewish population. 90% of Jews converted to Christianity. They were systematically the, the least economically successful 90% of the Jewish population. There's very clear evidence that it was an elite amongst Jews who then became uh, the, the modern day Jewish population. And then, for example, the Ashkenazi Jews of Eastern Europe, they represented an elite within an elite. They represented a bunch of Italian bankers who went to Germany, eventually found their way to Eastern Europe, and were actually also already an elite within that Jewish population. And then after years of repression and suffering in Eastern Europe, when they emerged into societies like America, where you could exercise your talents again, they had retained undiminished these very strong social and economic uh, abilities. And so uh, one other way that we can uh, uh, test this is, well, what about things like shocks to family size in England? And here, what's interesting is that from 1800 to 1880, family size was random. People made no attempt to control families. When they got married, it was just an accident of reproductive biology that would determine how many children you had. And so in this period, you get family sizes that vary from one to 18 in our sample of data. And the average person in this period had five or six brothers or sisters, right? So average family size is very big, but there's also this enormous range. What is the effect of that on people's life outcomes? It turns out for education, for social status, uh, it has almost no effect. You can be born into a family of 18 and it will have very, very little difference. There's a slight negative effect compared to being born into a family of one there's very little sign that the quantity of parental attention or resources is actually having a significant effect. The one thing it does affect is the wealth of the children, only in families where there's wealth to inherit. Then it has to get divided up amongst more people. But interestingly, that wealth shock dissipates over the next few generations. And if you move down to the second or third generation, 
By then, that shock to family size that occurred earlier has disappeared in the data. And people's wealth adjusts to whatever else is true about their social position. And so uh, one last thing then is uh, just kind of illustrating the interesting effects of selection in terms of social status. In this last picture here, what we can do is we can classify different groups in America very simply because we can take the directory of all doctors and say, for each type of surname, how many doctors are there who qualified in America and are registered in America? And this is relative to the average group. And it turns out now that the Copts now, uh, the champions, they have 12 times as many doctors per capita as the average group within modern America. That's all shaped by American immigration policy, right? And then the next champion group is the Hindu population. As I say, they're much bigger than the Coptic population, so they will be the new kind of super elite within American society. Then you get Indian Christians, Iranian Muslims, Maronites, Ashkenazi Jews, Sephardic Jews, Koreans, Chinese, Filipinos, Black Africans, Greeks, Armenians, Japanese. All of these are now elite groups within American society. The only group that is not elite in American society are those of European origin. <laughs> uh, they form uh, Trump voters and the, the, the basic strata of American society. And this is all shaped, actually, by American immigration policy. But what I wanted to emphasize here is that there's no clear association here of kind of social performance with any kind of particular religious or ideological or racial group, right? It's across all kinds of racial groups. You've got Copts, who are a tr very traditional form of Christianity, Hinduism, which is another very old religion. You have the Jewish population, you have Christians. You can have any group be elite, and you really just see here that a lot of this is just the shaping forces of American emigration. But the interesting implication of these surname studies is that this is setting in place a social structure that will abide in America for probably something like 300 years. <laughs> Right? And that these forces are actually very long-lasting, and there will be intermarriage between all of these groups and other groups, but they will tend to intermarry people of very high status from these other social groups, and so that you will get this uh, persistence. And so, as I say, we actually can learn a surprising amount about society just from looking at surnames. Now, what conclusions do I draw from this? A lot of people hearing that social mobility rates are actually extremely low say that this is the most depressing thing that they've ever heard. I think they're completely mistaken in terms of evaluating the world. This is actually a conclusion of tremendous optimism. Because what it's saying is that societies are surprisingly meritocratic. That people tend to have differences in talents, but they tend to get rewarded for those differences no matter what the social structures are. In medieval England, people of talent would find their way to the best positions, the, the best opportunities in the society, just as in modern England. Right now it's in finance. Previously, it was actually in law and working for the government. Uh, but, you know, th th there are all these opportunities. Uh, most social abilities actually seem to be biologically inherited. They get rewarded. That's not a pessimistic result, right? Because one of the things we do find here is that in the long run, there is complete social mobility. You just have to adjust your perspective. It just takes 300 years. But eventually, all of our children will be equal right? Or our children's 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 children, right? And all we're learning is that these processes are very slow, that there's actually relatively faithful inheritance. But the interesting thing is the upper classes in any society cannot defend themselves against downward social mobility. And it's just that these processes take a long time. But the one thing is, this is a strong argument, though, if it's really biological inheritance that's the dominant form of inheritance, for strongly limiting the rewards that society offers to those who end up in advantageous positions versus disadvantageous positions, right? Because it's not under individual control, it's very predictable from the social stratum that you're coming from
what the possibilities are for people. And that the, really the Swedish model is then a very good model where you want to limit the, the inequalities and rewards that society offers people. Thank you.